there's this kind of fateful story where all this, all this came from one kind of fateful conversation that Peter and I had on the phone in probably 2013 or 14. And so I, at the time was researching for my book that was trying to explain the nature of God in psychological terms. It's called everybody is wrong about God. Notice everybody means everybody. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. mean Christians. It doesn't mean Muslims. It doesn't mean atheists. It means everybody. And so, um, I'm working on this book talking about the psychology of religion. Peter ended up having a event with the rather famous skeptic and magician Penn Jillette. And he had a conversation with Penn and Peter said, don't you, somehow they got talking about feminism or gender studies or something like that. And Peter said, don't you think that the academic literature for gender studies works exactly the same way as the Bible works for Christians? And Penn was like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's academic literature. It's a totally different thing. And so Pete gets done with this thing and he calls me frantic. I remember still standing. I remember where I was standing in my driveway outside, like trying to clean up pine needles or something when he called me. And I'm like talking to him, standing there in the driveway. And he's like, all right, I'm going to throw this at you. Tell me if I'm crazy. Just tell me if I'm crazy. And he tells me the story. And he's like, so do you think gender studies, the, the academic literature and gender studies works like the Bible for feminism or whatever it is. And I was like, yes, obviously you're not crazy. You're exactly right. And everybody thought Pete was absolutely nuts for this observation. And I was like, and what's more. And I start telling him about the book I'm writing and he's like, holy crap, you know, and this is where we suddenly started to realize the parallelism between what was social justice as it was arising in the atheism movement. Like I said, it was happening there big time starting at probably 2008 and really hit a crescendo by 2011. Um, so it was a kind of a head of society by f five or six years at least. So we were, we were talking about what we were observing there and all of a sudden it's like all these pieces started to fit together. And so I finished my book and we, it talks about that aspect to some degree. And then Peter and I ended up started trying to figure out, well, is gender studies a religion? And we decided that, uh, kind of in the long tradition of, of hoaxes on theology journals where people just publish ridiculous theological claims and they're like, oh yeah, well, okay. Uh, that maybe, and then of course, following after Alan Sokol, we figured because it's clearly like these jargony words, they can't possibly know what they're talking about. Like, why don't we hoax them? Why don't we, you can't beat a religious canon by arguing against it. It's not yeah, possible. Exactly. The whole point is that it's intertextually sealed. You cannot argue against scripture and defeat it. So what can you do? You have to expose that it's scripture. So that was actually the deep motivation behind doing the academic papers that came to be called the grievance studies affair in, in the first place. I love how dramatically all of it unfolded. I, I'll definitely um, link to Mike Nana's videos on that because it's it's cool just watching the process from like the idea hitting you to when they finally get accepted, um, obviously. And it's no it's no small deal that that really happened. You know, it was a thing. <laughs> so, I mean, it, looking back on it now, do you um, do you feel like the the net gain and loss justifies having done it? Anything you would oh, yeah. do differently? I mean. I mean, there's always stuff that we would do differently. Peter likes to focus on the fact that we had one real scholar um, and that person basically was invincible because, you know, you publish this crazy paper and then somebody maybe gets suspicious of it and then all it takes is a Google search and then, oh, well, he's a real professor somewhere. And so somebody, you know, people did. They sent him emails asking him, what the heck? What's happened to you? Are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? But we told him, you know, he's a friend of ours. So we were like, don't answer any of the emails. He's like, I'm not getting involved. So he didn't answer any of the emails. And we just didn't answer any emails that people sent us asking questions about it. And they're like, well, crazy professors are everywhere. And so then we had to make up a bunch of professors because we only had one friend that was willing to risk his name. And also we weren't exactly telling people that we were doing it. Um, very, very secretive about it. And so we made up this one character and I think this is actually kind of a superficial we'll do something different point. We made up this one character, um, Helen Wilson, who wrote the dog park paper, the dog humping paper. And uh, we gave her a PhD in feminist studies and those basically don't exist. And so it was very easy for journalists who got suspicious to figure out that something was probably fishy 
happening there. Had we given her a PhD in gender studies, we probably would have had several more months to have been able to continue perpetrating our investigation. Uh, so, you know, there's that. I think um, if we had some stuff to do differently, I think we would have probably been much more clear about the way that academic hoaxing didn't succeed. I don't think that, that message got across. Everybody just assumed it was a hoax and I can understand why. Uh, but what we did was something significantly different and it doesn't seem to have been successfully communicated. Maybe the video of us laughing our asses off when <laughs> reading through the paper and the comments and things like that, you know, it's all really funny. So it's hard not to, but uh, maybe that gave the wrong impression that it was all just some kind of a joke. Because people and think we'll, a joke implies just a joke, but it's obviously right. so much more. Yeah, there was a lot more going on there. Um, and in fact, what we did, and nobody really appreciates it, is, you know, we started off with the hypothesis that they would accept hoaxes. And we started, that was in August. And by November, that was in 2017, we decided that hoaxes aren't possible. I kept a diary while we were doing it. And I went back and read the diary a couple months ago. And it's just astonishing the part through late November to the middle or end of December where I'm personally grappling with the fact that hoaxes didn't work and we have to do something different and people won't understand it. Uh, because it's not hoaxes and we have to admit that we were wrong that hoaxes would work because hoaxes won't work and it's like eventually I'm just gonna have to publish my diary I think but uh it's like 40,000 words I don't know if anybody really wants to read that much crap why not um so and some of it's some of it's like it's not bad it's not like oh I'd be embarrassed to have it out there it's just like inside baseball that's not really interesting um (laughs) But, but, but when you suggest yeah. that the hoaxes didn't work, what do you, I mean, obviously some of them got published. You mean it, No, it none of those got published. None oh, okay, of the ones okay. that were straight up hoaxes got published. With the fun, it's speaking of my diary, with a funny exception, I wrote in the diary that we only had one paper. It was like, at one point, it's like we have to rewrite every paper we've tried or throw them away because what we've done so far will not work. It's absolutely wrong. It won't work. And so with the exception of one paper, that's just too crazy to have any chance. And that was a dog paper the dog humping paper was actually much closer to a proper hoax. But even that, it's like they were warm to the idea, but we ended up, when the peer-reviewed comments came back, Helen ended up massively rewriting it, primarily Helen, massively rewriting it to get it in in consistency with, with, I was going to say scripture, (laughs) with with, with the academic literature. And um, that was was a seriously Freudian accident. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, so even it, you know, got completely retooled. It is not as ridiculous as it started. And so, you know, there's some, maybe we could conclude there was some susceptibility in that one journal, Gender, Place, and Culture, to to hoaxes, but only some. And uh, maybe a lot since they gave it an award too. But uh, nevertheless, uh, the other papers were actually – um, us taking what we were reading in the academic literature and then mixing it with our own crazy ideas and just trying to it's like stretch the boundaries. It's like we kind of knew where the edges were and we were like, well, what if we stretch it? Will they still take it? And then what we found out in most cases was that we either hadn't stretched it far enough or that somebody else had already in the academic literature stretched it further than we did. So it's like, really, we just wrote a bunch of papers that we, we knew what was wrong with them, but they uh, fit in. And so communicating that point didn't succeed. In fact, there's been a recent academic paper that came out saying that, you know, what we wrote up in the first place was saying, well, the main difference was that we intentionally knew our, you know, our, our intentions weren't believing the papers. We said something like, um, what did we say? We said something like the main difference between the existing literature and the papers that we submitted is that we knew what we were writing wasn't true, but that's not actually what we should have wrote. What we should have written was, we knew why our papers shouldn't be publishable. We knew why they were methodologically broken. We knew why the logic didn't follow. We knew why somebody who was, who was capable of doing a rigorous analysis would not have accepted that paper as rigorous analysis. And that's a different claim. And if I think we had communicated that better in the first place, then perhaps things would have gone a little differently. So, I mean, most of the things of what would we have done differently, it would have been like communications 
issues. There's a couple of the papers that I wish we hadn't bothered trying to screw around with. Um, the, I mean, they obviously didn't go anywhere. So, but I doubt that any of these publications would have argued that their basis for accepting it was that they found it to be true. I mean, there's no way to, to wipe the egg off of their face. I feel like that's actually, in fact, we talked about that new academic paper that just came out. That's actually the case that it makes. <laughs> it says that the paper in particular, he's talking about the fat bodybuilding paper should be unretracted because they thought it was good scholarship when they accepted it. And so it should be unretracted. Okay. And so the thing is, we made that case too. We said when we went public that, and in fact, I sent a letter to Hypatia and put it on Twitter. So I publicized it even. Um, when we went public, we wrote letters, or I wrote a letter to Hypatia, but we openly said the papers that we wrote that do not have false data in them should stand. The papers that do have false data have to go. And so the journals should have to maintain them. And so this, art this article that came out um, last month or the last few weeks argues the same thing. If fat studies thought that was a good idea, fat studies should stand by it. Of course, the person who wrote it tried to criticize us for thinking, you know, it was all a big joke, but it's like, no, you actually criticize the thing the popular interpretation ran with which we never wanted to have happen and never believed in the first place. And you have now forwarded basically the same argument we did. And so, you know, we've been invited to write a response. So hopefully, you know, we can do that and, and it'll get published and we'll see what happens from that. Okay. But if I, you know, no, they're, they're not wiping any egg off of their faces. In fact, what they're trying to do is put their head in the sand, sand and pretend it didn't happen for the most part. Yeah. Although so a book was published um, talking about it by a couple of people that we ended up citing in our papers too. Um, a book was published, an academic book, uh, in late, or sometime in 2019. And um, it quotes us <laughs> rather hilariously. It quotes Helen saying that, <laughs> saying that we suffered so you don't have to. It's <laughs> Christ-like is our sacrifice. And then uh, it quotes me as saying that the, that the social justice literature is like the nuclear waste of scholarship. And then it's in a, I'm, I'm so happy that that's in a <laughs> book. It's like, see, that's, that's funny as hell that they put that stuff in there. That's just funny. That's a nice little badge of honor. Do, do you feel like it was a, a personal sacrifice for you? Cause I know Peter suggested that, um, it was, it was pretty costly for him just in terms of like his friends and, and even his, uh, workplace kind of turning on him. Yeah, my workplace didn't wasn't relevant, but um, my friends, I, I exacted a rather heavy toll there. I lost most of my left leaning friends, including family members that are have pretty contentious relationships with now. Pretty, if they are on the left, they pretty much kind of are like, uh, yeah, what you lost your mind. And then um, it was an enormous amount of time to do that. I mean, it was an, it's like it kind of redirected the entire course of my life. And it's kind of impossible to say that it's, it's in a direction that's making me happy. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to read social justice shit all day, every day. I, yeah. I don't. I don't enjoy it. I don't find it thrilling. Um, I don't make any money really doing it. So it's like it hasn't been like net positive in, in those regards. But at the end of the day, it's like I still think it needed to be that or something of similar impact or more impact needed to be done. So I'm glad I did it, but the cost has been real. Yeah. It's I'm watching all these people describe what it's like to suffer in the pandemic. And I'm like, that was my every day for like the last two and a half years. It's like, I never go out with my friends ever. I'm not even sure I have any around here anymore. Wow. <laughs> and it's, so it's like the costs have been kind of real and you know, it's not the, you know, I don't think I'm crazy, but I the but the the mental cost of reading this like cynical, pessimistic, nasty, race baiting, just awful stuff every day. It's not net good for one's well being. 